Hey everyone, thank you very much for joining us again. This is the Game Logic Q&A sessions, uh, and this time I'm delighted to be joined by Richard Brown, Head of External Projects at Digital Extremes. They're probably best known for Warframe, uh, one of the most successful and respected free-to-play games in the industry. So, Richard, can you tell us about you, your, your role with Digital Extremes, and, and what that entails? Sure, uh, good morning. Um, so, uh, a quick background, I've been doing this video game nonsense for about 32 years. Uh, started uh, writing a couple of games on the side and then went through a long and arduous career with Domark, who uh, became Eidos, and then Cygnosis, who then became Sony Europe, uh, and then Domark again, and Philips Media, and uh, came to the States to work for Microprose, and then Universal Interactive, THQ, uh, went to the film industry, kind of sort of, for a little bit, did some transmedia. Uh, and then I've been at Digital Extremes for the last two and a half years, and we're basically setting up external publishing. So we're doing projects with third parties um, to, to, to sit alongside Warframe and, and other projects and grow our user base and player base. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, just to let you guys know, so Richard came to my attention um, with his series of great retroactive posts of the various projects he's worked on over his career. Uh, as you heard there, he's, I think you've been pretty much anywhere and everywhere and, and touched every platform known to man um, throughout the, the whole process. Uh, so I'd love to know, Richard, I mean, who or, or what got you into video games in the first place? Ah, uh, so uh, basically my mum was a maths teacher. So uh, she brought home a Commodore PET one summer and said, I've been told uh, by, the, by the school that I have to be teaching this next year. And so I spent a, a summer working uh, uh, with a pet trying to blow it up and, and playing golf games with little hash marks and, and horse racing games where the little pie sign would jump over the hash mark. Uh, good gambling early on. Yep. Uh, and then that, have, that moved on to BBC's, uh, which I started programming with a friend at school and, uh, and started doing graphics and stuff on. Um, and basically, uh, it sort of led from there. Uh, the most bizarre story of all, really, is that uh, I, I filled in a questionnaire to, with my high, best high scores on a Commodore 64 shoot 'em up games and got invited up to London to playtest Mega Apocalypse, which oh, was a game that Simon Nickel wrote, uh, and got chatting to Simon while I was there. Uh, ended up getting kind of friendly with him, and we ended up, ended up spending the summer down in Brighton playtesting it with him. Uh, and asked him, you know, did, do you think that Martech, who was the company who published it, would be interested in a BBC version of it? Uh, and he said yes, and put me in touch with David Martin, who, who ran Martech. And so my friend Russ and me ended up porting Mega Apocalypse to the BBC. And awesome. so uh, that was the first one. And then he came back to me a few months later with a, a thing called the Computer Maniac's Diary, which was a horrible, horrible little free giveaway that the book club uh, for those who don't know what the book club is, years and years ago, you used to get sent this little leaflet and you signed up for the book club and you'd get books every month. And the whole gag was they'd give you free ones and sell you them for 99p uh, so that you subscribe and then they'd just send you a book randomly every month. Um, so their free giveaway was the Computer Maniac's Diary and they didn't have anyone to do the BBC version of it. So I had to write it in two and a half weeks. And, uh, <laughs> and the guy who project managed me on it was actually a guy from Domark. Um, and, and I went back to school after that, and he phoned me up one day and said, do you want to come and work for me? And so I went and joined the dark side of publishing in, in 1989. Awesome. God, it's a lifetime ago. Yeah, we were born. That, that, was, that was the year I was born, so it's... it's uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've come full circle. So I mean, out, of the, out of all the projects that, that you have worked on, uh, are there any in particular that didn't get the recognition it, it anticipated to receive? And if so, what do you think could have been done differently? Oh, wow, that's a hard one. Uh, there's a few that we killed. <laughs> <laughs> it could have been great. They could have been contenders. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I think games get, uh, games tend to get the, 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 the reviews and, and justice that they deserve. I mean, um, you know, Microcosm, uh, was was kind of like you know a huge highlight for me, but it was written on the FM Towns Marty and released in Japan. So yep. um, you know it didn't get as much coverage in the UK uh, until later on when it was ported to other platforms. You know when it actually was being written and released, it was it was absolutely groundbreaking. Um, and so I think we lost out on a little bit of that bit, but um, but it was on the cover of the first show uh, first issue of Edge. So um, oh sweet. Uh, so there's a lovely picture of me in the uh, in the, the round windows at Cygnosis at Harrington Docks, going, 
<laughs> and it's uh, like I'm stuck in a washing machine. I think somebody commented. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think you know the, the, the games that stand out, the Company of Heroes sort of era at, at uh, THQ, uh, GP500, still one of the best racing games ever that Beam Software did when I was at Microprose. Hmm. Uh, Warrior 3 with the guys at Zipper. I think, you know, at the time they all got, you know, probably the, the credit they deserve. But uh, there's nothing that stuck, snuck under the radar. Titan Quest is one that actually has become much more popular in later years than it actually was at launch because our marketing department didn't do a terribly great job with it, I don't think. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, THQ Nordic's taken it on and re released it and it's got its, uh, a life of its own again. Yeah, uh, it's, it's funny how these things can come back and have a second shot at it. Absolutely, uh, that very lead, leads me on very nicely to the next question of: out of all of the game worlds that you have worked on or with, which one would you like to most explore again, and why? Well, that's a tough one. Uh, I, I think you know, at Cygnosis, when we built Microcosm, we basically built out you know, and this was kind of way ahead of its time in a way we built out a whole universe um so scavenger 4 or nova storm as it was called on the playstation was actually set in the same planetary system and everything else that uh, that microcosm was so there was a whole backstory we wrote of how all these g games would link together and it was kind of like going to be you mm. know, trilogies and then beyond of like everything was going to be set in this universe um so we actually had a, a massive universe in 1991 that we were playing around with um but beyond that i mean titan quest yeah that's, that's one of the ones that sticks there is just something that was fabulous super in commander that we did with chris taylor um up at gas powered was another one that you know could have gone on and on um but yeah that's a uh, that's a, that's a difficult question that but those are those are the ones that would spring to mind sort of is, uh, do you think there's any ever any scope for you guys to get back together again there <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I still stay in touch with a lot of the Signosis guys, but everyone's uh, moved long past. And like, you know, like I said, it was, it was kind of revolutionary and cool at the time. It's like, wow, this whole universe idea. But, you know, I think Marvel's done that rather well. Yeah, yeah, probably. Yeah, I think you're right there. Um, Everybody does yeah. it now. It's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and again, this, this leads me very nicely to, to this one. So, I mean, I've noticed from your posts that a lot of projects you've worked on have had lofty ambitions, um, but maybe not quite enough resources. Um, and I've seen Sean Layden recently as well mention this, saying that games have, you know, a massive scope and, and maybe it needs to be dialed back. So I'd love to know your opinion on this. I mean, do you think that that scope creep is prevalent? Um, is it worse today than it ever was? And, and what advice can you give to studios to manage that? Oh, I could get on my soapbox here. <laughs> so I, I have an, uh, there was an article I wrote for uh, an online uh, uh, magazine uh, several years ago, actually, about the, the damage that uh, reselling games and GameStop did to the industry. And part of that was, you know, taking 12 to 15 hour games that we were doing um, and, and having to balloon them out because basically you had to find a way of, of well, the player keeping the disc because yep. people were just buying it and taking it back to the shop. Um, and, 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 you know, I, I get the ownership argument and I'm, I'm, I'm totally on board with it from a, uh, an individual standpoint. It's when a corporation like GameStop makes it basically the basis of their business uh, and forces you, you know, you go to GameStop and they'd be like, yeah. Do you want a used one? Do you want a used one? And they're like, no, I want the new one. Well, I have the used one. You know, we never saw a dime of the money of any used game. So, you know, this came to a, sort of a head when we were doing Darksiders, which I thought was an amazing game of Vigil. And then we were doing Darksiders 2. And at that point, we sort of started putting into our green light decks at THQ. There's literally a slide that says, what are you going to do to stop this game from churning? So Darksiders 2 had this, you know, you had the ability to go to chests and leave messages for people. So on Xbox Live, you could kind of pick up messages through your friends. And so, you know, that didn't work because <laughs> it wasn't really a compelling reason. So, you know, when it came out, I said, you know, it, it'll sell a million and a half units and that's it. And sure enough, it did. And it churned and churned and churned. And we know from the data that we get from the back end, the online stuff, that, you know, at least three times the people who bought the game played it on the Xbox alone, let alone PlayStation. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, the, the reaction to that was, well, you either have to have multiplayer. So everything started adding multiplayer or you have to make it a massive, massive game. And so it all ballooned up. 
And then, you know, you look at things like Alien Isolation, which is one of my favorite games. Mm. Uh, Alien Isolation, in effect, failed um, financially because it took a while to do, but also it churned. You know, people played it, it was, thought it was absolutely fantastic, and then took it back. Uh, you know, so I had an argument with, with Sega a few years ago, actually, about, you know, just do Alien Isolation 2. Everyone will buy it, <laughs> but just do it digital only. So there is no return, right? Uh, and I think they'd make loads of money because it was such a great game. And, you know, the creative assembly guys are just so amazingly talented. Um, so I think, you know, the, what we're hitting now is this, this point, and I think, you know, with, the, with COVID this year, it's become even more prevalent, is that there is a digital only market. And that does allow you to start scaling things back. Um, and we're also, you know, we're now in this games as a service world. Um, so the other alternative is what we do with Warframe. You know, when Warframe launched, it wasn't a very big game. Um, it kind of was, I mean, you could play it infinitely, but at the end of the day, it's just been added on and added on and added on. That was a systems choice rather than the content choice. And then they just added more and more, more content. So seven years down the line, there's you know, so much content. It takes you years to get through now. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's it is if you can encapsulate a game down to its core roots and then build on that over time, that's what games as a service and especially free to play allows you to do. Um, so I think there's a lot more focus. I mean, that's where we're focused now. You know, the, the game where we're, we're going to launch is not going to be a hundred hour epic. Yep. It's going to be built to be a hundred hour epic month by month by month by month. And so you're kind of now developing the pilot episode and then adding episodes rapidly, um, which is, you know, Fortnite and everything else is what they're doing, right? They're just adding chapters and chapters and new characters and, and new things to get involved with. Um, so I think, you know, there has been this bloated thing and that's where the $60 game has gone, right? I mean, to justify $70 now, you know, you have to have an open world and hundreds of hours of gameplay and, you know, the churn thing's kind of taken away by the fact that, you know, it takes you months to finish it. <laughs> um, and, you know, th there are exceptions. I mean, God of War and, 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 and games like that are short enough that you could churn it, but, you know, the level of quality that Sony can put into those things kind of makes you want to keep it anyway. Um, but also, you know, they don't care, right? They're trying to sell hardware, yeah. so they, they can afford <laughs> they can afford to do a sixty dollar game <laughs> in that way. But um, but yeah, I mean, who's going to take back God of War? It's such a great game. No, exactly. So so I mean, and this leads me on to, to my final question: uh, Who or what do you think is the next big thing for a games as a service world? I um, yeah, I think. Uh, Genshin Impact has been very interesting to watch. Um, yeah. You know, the, the whole construct of a mobile console PC game that kind of gives you effectively the same game across all platforms. Um, and, and what surprised me about Genshin so much is that they've stuck somewhat to a mobile model. And I've always been of the belief that a mobile monetization model and a PC console monetization model are very separate things. And they've kind of mm -hmm. crossed the streams and are certainly doing extraordinarily well with it. Um, and it's a lovely game, which helps. Um, but I think, uh, you know, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. I think you're going to see a lot more of I can play it wherever I want to. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, free-to-play is, is kind of just going to be more and more part of the business. I mean, you have to break down the barriers of getting hold of a game. You know, $60 is a big barrier. $70 is a, is a big barrier. You know, it has to be, if you're going to pay that for a game, it's got to be sort of, you know, the best of the best. Um, so, you know, how do I, as a, as a developer or publisher, you know, get to a market? Well, I give it away. You know, come and, come and play my game. If you like it, stay. If you don't, okay. I, you know, we did something wrong. Um, because, you know, there's, there's so much choice of entertainment out there. You know, we're not fighting for money as much as we're fighting for time. Um, it's kind of the way I look at it. And so you've got, you know, no matter who you are, you're, you've got free entertainment or perceived free entertainment everywhere, whether it be Netflix or Amazon Prime or Game Pass, right? I mean, yeah. Game Pass has come on now and you've got your subscription and you've got hundreds of games and Microsoft's trying to lock you into this ecosystem that you just never lose your Xbox. Um, that makes it harder for me to get to a consumer <laughs> and get to a player. So, all right, here's our game. It's free. You can play it. And, you know, we stick very much to the, the theory of, of Warframe in which, the, you know, you can get everything in the game by playing it. You don't have to buy anything. Um, but, you know, if I can keep you as a player for a month, then the chances are I'll probably monetize something out of you at some point because you're enjoying what you're doing. And, and it becomes a hobby, you know, and that's, that's kind of where games are going. I mean, because of the... 
the game as a service model, you're basically trying to sell somebody a new hobby. Um, and, and, and people spend money on their hobbies. I mean, whether it be collecting train sets or scale electrics or toys, you know, to put on your shelf, you know, Warframe's a hobby, you know, you, you yeah. play it and you get on there and you go on there for, with friends and you build social networks. And, and that's the other part of it is building the social side of it out so that, you know, it's somewhere you want, you want to go and, and hang out with your friends. I mean, I think that's why WoW has just, you know, set, stood the test of time for so very long. It's, you know, I have a friend who for years was subscribing for WoW and I'm like, really, you go and play it every day? And he's like, no, we kind of just get together once a week and go and chat. Yeah. <laughs> it became a glorified 3D chat room, basically. It's like the virtual pub now, isn't it? <laughs> exactly. Well, and, you know, at this point where you can't actually go to a pub, yeah. um, it's, uh, it's, it's a great place to hang out. And, you know, if you, can, if you can provide that space for people and then allow them to go off and do games, you know, do missions and all the rest of it and have fun together, mm. then, you know, it's, it's kind of this, this multiverse that everyone keeps trying to talk to, but every game yeah. has their own little multiverse because you want to keep them within it. So I think that's what we're going to see a lot more. If I don't need $60 games, $70 games, they're not going away. I mean, that's what drives console sales. That's what drives hardware. Um, and and I, I love them to death. Ghost of Shishima, game of the year, no question. Nice. Um, awesome. Uh, well, but, talking of uh, talking of multiverses and, and hobbies, and God forbid games didn't exist anymore, <laughs> what, what, what would you be doing? Oh, that's a... <laughs> uh, well, I've got some chickens. Could be raising more <laughs> chickens. Um, I have no idea. Actually, I mean, no, I would. I'd go into film and TV. I spent three yeah. years doing that and trying to build interactive narrative and move interactive narrative forward. And uh, actually, we were pitching Netflix on interactive stories long before Black Mirror got there and Minecraft and everything else. Uh, um, I think I'd go into the linear storytelling world. I, you know, I used to write a lot. You know, that was part of the joy of being a Psygnosis was being able to create these worlds and write these stories. And always wished I had time, although I was not that good. I'm not that good a writer. I tried it once. Uh, I, had a, I had some time off after I left Universal and actually went and wrote a couple of screenplays. And then uh, the Universal script department absolutely <laughs> tore them a new one, if you pardon the expression. Uh, and then I worked for several years with a film producer and used to watch screenwriters come out of his office in tears. So um, it's a hard <laughs> life. Hard life being a writer. Well, but, like, oh, it's easy. I think you made the right choice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stick with the God I've got while I still can, you know. I mean, you know, it's 32 years of literally uh, being able to live with my hobby. I mean, I still play games all the time. I still, you know, will be sat in front of a, a console or a PC all day long, whether I have to or not. And uh, Brilliant. It, it's an incredible blessing to be able to have that in your life. And I've got two young daughters now and they're like, and they, you know, as a, a responsible parent, I kind of like try and push them towards the education side. But at the same time as somebody who's been through this, I'm like, you got to find what you love. You know, Brilliant. If, if you can do that and, and have a, a, a job that you do, even if you were, even if you didn't have to, then um, it's a perfect place to be. Brilliant. Well, Richard, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Uh, it's You're been a welcome. pleasure to get to know you. Um, I've no doubt that our viewers will find your stories very interesting. Um, so guys, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Uh, please do like the video. Please do share the video uh, and keep an eye on our page for, for more to come. As I say, this has been Game Logic. This has been our Q&A session. Thank you very much. See you again.